Hey, I'm Mark Beebe. I'm one of the pastors here at Cokesbury. Thanks for joining us. It's just so good to be with you again. I work with Recovery Ministries principally at Cokesbury. And um, man, uh, it's just been, uh, it's been so good to be able to continue the work that God has given us every week that we've been together kind of going through this together. So um, glad, again that you, glad again that you're with us, however you are. If you're online, great. If you're listening, 98.7, great. Just uh, thanks so much for being a part of Cokesbury Church today. And thanks so much also for the support you've been providing us with to be able to continue the ministry and the work to care for people and be with people that um, we know we're about here at this church. I want to ask you if you'd pray with me. Sweet Jesus, thank you so much for this time and for the work that you have that you're giving to this place. Speak into our hearts today and just challenge us with um, everything you want to say to us. Open us. Open us up. In your sweet name we pray. Amen. Before we get started, I uh, want to let you know that I got to be and Carol got to be, uh, we got to be grandparents again. Since we have not seen any of you, that happened the end of April. So we have another grandson, Holden, and um, he's doing really well. So uh, thankful for that. And it's been an exciting time to be able to watch all that, watch all that come together. But I wanted to, uh, what I wanted to get into today is a conversation or a talk about how, how are we all handling this lovely thing that is occurring in all of our lives, anxiety. This week, we started a new series in recovery, and it has to do with loss. And I wanted to take one piece of that to kind of get us in to what we're going to talk about today. And this is it. I put up a, I put up a picture of an earthquake. And as you're seeing that picture, that is from a place in Alaska that had an earthquake. And I don't know if you've ever talked to somebody who's been through uh, an actual earthquake. We had one. We had one here in Tennessee, sometime here in Knoxville, sometime it was early spring, maybe late winter here. And, and uh, you know, I was working on some stuff, and I sort of felt this odd thing, and it sort of sounded, it felt like a blast, but it wasn't a blast. And I started looking around, and uh, I started I started looking online and seeing people starting to post stuff like, "Did you feel that? Did you feel that?" And they were all over the place, all over the area. And that was a mild, that was like a mild deal. But when people that I know have been in earthquake situations, whether they're traveling and they've been in a hotel or they've been wherever, they will tell you they're they've never they're never going to get over that. They're never going to forget that. It's going to be like an experience that's going to really shape kind of the way they feel about the status of things because it is very different when the ground beneath your feet is no longer something that you can count on where you're you you're like I'm not on a firm place here this isn't firm I'm not I'm not like I'm not confident of what's beneath me I'm not sure what's going to happen beneath me that's a tough place to be and I think that that in a lot of ways, is where we have all been over these last weeks. And, and when we look forward, there's kind of even, even more to it. The ground doesn't really look a lot more stable going forward in the next, in the next weeks and months. We, we've never had an experience like this, and so we have no idea how to account for it, and we have no idea what firm grounding really is, at least situationally. There's a word that I think is uh, helpful to get us into, into more of what this is about. It's catastrophizing, catastrophizing. It's kind of like the, the image or the impression is, you know what, it really is true that the sky is falling. Not only is one thing, not only is one thing going on in my life that's really, I'm really having to struggle with, but now like it's one after another, after another, after another, kind of like emotional, uh, kind of like emotional or spiritual dominoes. The sky is falling. And what do we do when all of those experiences and events are like coming up onto us and coming up into us? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna produce inside of ourselves a much higher level of anxiety. Anxiety begins to really build in us when we get to a place of awareness that 
something or some things or everything or everything everywhere, the more severe and difficult and challenging it gets, everything everywhere is out of my, and I put that in parentheses for a reason, out of my control. Now like, is everything in the world for all time, in all places, in every way, is it out of control? Or is it out of my control? And we're gonna talk about that today. Who, whose control would it be within? Some of us are experiencing, because we are trying to satisfy not only the stuff that we gotta do with our life, but also the stuff that other people around us um, are doing with their lives because we're spending so much more, in a lot of cases, so much more time together. We're kind of experiencing what I'm calling, what I'm gonna call the dancing bear syndrome. If you are, uh, if you're a performance oriented person and you keep score and you wanna keep score of how you're doing with your marriage, how you're doing with your kids, how you're doing with your job and you're working from home, how you're doing with the things around the house, how you're doing with other responsibilities. If you're a person that keeps score, well, you have that performance orientation. And you kind of are that person that's kind of going to go, you know what, it's not really going to be a good day until I get all those 10 things done. It's not going to be a good day until I get eight out, until I get an eight out of 10 score, or probably in the case of this, a nine out of 10 score. It's not really going to be okay until everybody is happy and content. And I'm not used to maybe fixing lunch for these two kids, and I'm not used to doing this over here, and I'm not used to doing that, and I got to go do this more, and I got to do, do that more, and people want me to be here, and people want me to be there. And the dancing bear syndrome is I need to dance for all the people in my life. And I definitely, I don't know, I, I, lose, my, I lose my own dance and I kind of lose my own, I kind of lose my own rhythm and I kind of lose my own song. You know, like, I, I don't know if you have a favorite song or not, but if you do, it's kind of like that, that. Well, now, now in this environment, I'm playing everybody else's song. I'm doing everybody else's dance. And I'm kind of like a dancing bear. And I'm kind of wanting to make sure that I entertain and meet the needs and, and maybe expectations of all these other people that are around me now a whole lot more than they were before. What am I going to do to satisfy all those kinds of people that are um, in my life and around me? And, and we were used to being able to take ourselves and go physically over here and then work over here and focus over here and do what we're doing over here. And now those compartments of, I'm gonna go over here to work and then I'm gonna come home and then I'm gonna do this. Like they don't exist. Those compartments are kind of blown away. So now everything's kind of like wide open, which is again, even more of a producer of anxiety. In the dancing bear syndrome, I never really feel like I can quit. In the dancing bear syndrome, I'm really not sure it's ever really been enough of a dance. In the dancing bear syndrome, I'm never really sure whether all the people in my life are actually satisfied. And if they're not content, well, how in the world can I be content? And that, all of that produces this lovely experience that is so life-sucking of anxiety. Anxiety causes about 20 different things in us, some of which we're gonna talk about, but I mean, principally anxiety, it raises, it raises levels of, it raises levels of adrenaline, so it makes me hyperactive and hyper-focused and hyper-intense about everything I'm going through, so now if it was not a big deal six weeks ago, it's a very big deal now once anxiety starts to take over. And the other thing it does is, Anxiety lowers levels of serotonin in my brain, so it lowers the level of any kind of satisfaction or contentment that I have. So there's a physical side to anxiety, which is why people are gonna go, well, I mean, one way to deal with anxiety, and they're right, one way to deal with anxiety is to raise your levels of serotonin. Well, how do you do that? Well, you take better care of yourself. You know, you go, you go on a walk, you go for a run, you go to the gym, you go do something where you are taking better care of yourself and you're experiencing some satisfaction, your serotonin levels are gonna go up. But the anxiety component really has two parts to it. One is 
and, and I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna experience a level or levels of anxiety our whole lives because life is life. You know, life's just life. Jesus said, this world that we're living in, it is always gonna present challenges to us. This world that we're living in, it is always gonna have dilemmas. This world that we're living in is always gonna have, it's just always gonna have difficulties. So anxiety is gonna be just a part of us living. And so there is the anxiety that is beside me that sort of sits beside me at various times in my life. Sometimes a lot takes up a lot more space. Sometimes takes up a lot less space. Sometimes maybe um, on a really good day or a really good stretch time, I'm not really aware of it at all. But then, and that, that anxiety beside me is like situational, circumstantial stuff. But then there is the anxiety that is in me, that is like in my soul, in my heart, in my core. And that anxiety, when it becomes something that is in me, it really begins to take, it does begin to take life, security, satisfaction, the feeling of worth maybe even, the sense of okayness, the sense of wellness, the sense of peace, it begins to like slowly draw that out of me. And who is the winner? Who is the winner in that process of the outcomes of anxiety? Who is the winner of that? Well, it, it certainly isn't you. It certainly isn't your relationships. It certainly isn't the people around you. I mean, it might, it might be, they might think it's, it's okay for a while because, you know, in your quest to be the dancing bear, you take even better care of them and try to work even harder for them to be satisfied and for you to be able to meet their expectations. The problem is you won't be able to sustain that. And so they're going to end up, they're going to end up with, a, as you're over-functioning, when you stop doing that, they're going to be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed because you're going to feel like a failure. And so that's inevitably anxiety draws life, draws security, satisfaction, contentment, peace out of us. Well, who wins? Who wins from that? Well, God doesn't win from that, obviously, because God says he's coming, he's coming into your life to bring you a fullness and a richness and a, and a, and a, a shelf, you know, a place to land, a contentment. It's kind of like God's like the exact opposite of what I want to do is have you feel like the ground beneath you is unstable because what God is telling us is over and over and over again, listen, I want to be that ground. I want to be the ground that you stand on, that you have confidence in. I want to be the ground that you trust. And so God isn't winning from anxiety dominating our lives, but I'll tell you who is, and that would be the enemy. Because the enemy's one job, is to completely mess with, dismantle, create disjuncture and dissatisfaction in your life right now. That's what he chooses to do and the lives of everybody around you. You know, the, the, the question I think for this morning to, to, get us, to get us someplace is this, is, is it true or false that control is gonna bring me Relief. Is it true or is it false that control is going to bring me relief? And here's the question that comes out of that question. Is it true that if I could guarantee you that I could give you and provide you with control over all things, all people, all places, all everything, if it's true that I could say I could provide you with that and provide you even with the control of the satisfaction of other people that they, um, they would finally be content and happy and pleased with you and all of that, wouldn't it be true that the next thing you would be fearing that you could not control would be whether or not you could actually sustain that experience of completion, success, satisfaction? Wouldn't it be true that you'd be afraid of what it would be like if you lost it? So Psalm 81 kind of gets us into this. It says, listen to me, O people, while I give you stern warnings, O Israel, if you would only, meaning which you're not, if you would only listen to me. 
And then he goes on, you must never have a foreign God. You must not bow down before a false God. So this is my question. Is it true that our need for control and our fear of not having it is actually, and fear for that matter, is it true that those are idols? Is it true that it's easy for us to put those pieces of life completely ahead of God and what God is saying to you, which is, would you please realize that I'm the ground beneath your feet and that I am stable and that I am reliable and that I am trustworthy and that you can count on me and that you can believe in the fact that the ground beneath your feet, that is me, is gonna be there for all time, for all places and forever? Do you realize that? Well, when we are allowing, when we're allowing fear, anxiety or anything else to be God to us, the thing that is dominating us, more importantly, the thing that we're paying the most attention to, when the thing that we pay the most attention to is anxiety or fear, isn't it true that that's an idle relationship? The question's gonna be, which way do you wanna live? Do you wanna live with the need to be in control of everything, everybody at all times, and you wanna believe that you're not gonna be safe until you really have that, you really have that control over all that stuff? Or do you think it'd be a better way to live if you would say, I don't know how things are gonna work. I don't know what exactly is gonna happen. I don't know about whether everybody else is gonna be satisfied. I, don't, I really don't think I'm gonna keep dancing as the bear, I'm the dancing bear for people in my life. But you know what I am gonna do? I'm gonna figure out, I'm gonna figure out what it would take for me to let go of my desire to be in charge, which really is driven by my fear, which is really my idol. And I'm gonna see what it would be like if I began to live my life out of trust. I am standing I am standing on the ground of God. I am standing on the promises of God. I am standing on the confidence of God. I am standing on the demonstrated grace of God. I am standing on the power and the authority of God. That is what I'm standing on. I'm going to give up the belief that control would bring me peace, and I'm gonna to begin to accept the fact that trust will bring me peace. And now that I get to that point where trust is everything and the trust is not gonna be in myself, but the trust is gonna be in God, now some really creative things can begin to happen, even in the middle of higher levels of anxiety and higher levels of, of challenges in life. Here's some things that can happen. I, begin to, I can begin to ask some pretty creative questions, like this one. What can I change about me, if, if I'm really not in control of people, places, or things in my life, well, what, that would leave me, right? <laughs> what can I change about me? What am I willing to let God change about me? There's a, a writer, Richard Rohr, that um, wrote about this idea that he calls holy acceptance. Holy acceptance. And he talks about God comes to you with an idea or a concept that, um, you know, isn't really very attractive to you, something totally different to you, something foreign to you, something you're completely unsure of, something you've maybe never heard of before he comes with, with this challenge to your life. And he sits down with you and he offers that up to you. And there it sits. And he, you know, despite your anxiety about, well, what would happen if I really looked at that? What would happen if I really did that? How different would it be? Is that really safe? Is that really reasonable? God still sits there. And the offer for what he is bringing to you stands. And the acceptance of that experience of, I, I, may, not, I may not be able to actually accept the direction that God is sending me, I'm not sure I can accept the idea that God is bringing to me. I'm not sure that I can accept the challenge that God is putting into my life right now, the push that God is, is bringing into me. But here's what I am gonna accept. I'm gonna accept that I am sitting with a holy, trustable, righteous, loving 
grateful God. I'm going to trust that I know that because he sent Jesus to me. He sent Jesus to me and to the rest of the world. He offered up the blood of Jesus for me and for the world. He told me how much he loved me. <clears throat> he showed me how much he loved me. He showed me that he would never quit on me. He showed me that he would never leave me. He showed me that he would never walk away from me. And so I'm going to now have a holy acceptance of the demonstrated history of the love of God in Jesus. And that's how I'm gonna start with the challenge that God is gonna bring into my life about growth or change or whatever, as I begin to wonder why, you know, why is it that I feel like I'm on such a ragged place, at such a ragged place with the people in my life? Why is it I feel like I'm at such a ragged place with me? Why is it I'm not taking good care of myself? Why is it I'm not sleeping enough? Why is it I'm over-functioning? Why is it I'm, I'm uh, dialing into the expectations of everybody else in my life and I'm very uncomfortable when I can't meet them? Why is it that I only feel like I have value if I do get all of that stuff done? And God's like, well, let's sit down together. And here's this challenge for you. Let's revalue you. Let's revalue who you are. Let's revalue where your worth comes from. And so the holy acceptance experience is taking in the confidence that we have in, in God who has already demonstrated his grace, love, compassion, and dependability for us. I mean, faithfulness to that, faithfulness to that holy acceptance, faithfulness to God's intervention, intervening in me, you know, like it's not void of adversity. It's not going to be void of problems. All the people that God intervenes with that you can read about in the Bible, all those people have all kinds of adversity when God begins to do that. None of them have the good, easy path. None of them have, it's like, well, I mean, I fell asleep and then God touched me and then he brought this new perspective to me. And then, you know what? I woke up in the morning and man, things were dandy. It's like, no, things probably won't be dandy because it's tough given, number one, it's tough giving up control. It's tough giving up our perspective. It's tough tough giving up our framework. It's tough giving up our understanding and it's tough giving up our um, understanding of wisdom and knowledge that belongs to us. So faithfulness isn't void of adversity. God's faithfulness is not void of adversity. God never said that, you know, I'm going to be faithful to you, but nothing is ever going to happen in your life. And we, if we would like to believe that, again, what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up to be in a relationship with a God um, that, that isn't really who, who God has been for us. He's been much more honest than that. He's been much clearer than that. And he's been much more direct than that about how he loves us and how he involves himself in our lives and much more clear about the reality of life, the challenges of life. It's, it's all right there. So faithfulness isn't void of adversity either on God's part or on, on our parts. What will relieve high levels of anxiety for sure is us taking the resurrection of Jesus seriously. The resurrection in action says this life, the way that I'm, things are going on in my life right now today, right now today, this isn't all there is. This is a bad place maybe. I'm really uncomfortable here. I'm really not satisfied here. I don't feel at rest here. Maybe I, maybe I really don't even, I don't even necessarily feel like the ground I'm standing on is God's ground and I even have confidence in that. Maybe that's where I am. But the resurrection in action is gonna say, this life as I know it right now, this difficulty that I'm experiencing right now, this is not, this is not all there is. There's more to the story than what is immediately happening to me right now. And so because of that, I never, ever surrender to the adversity. Because of that, because of the resurrection in action, I never, ever surrender to the adversity, but I always surrender to what Jesus has already done for me. I always surrender to what Jesus has already done for me. I always invite God's preferred future to be in my life. You know, I ask for it. God, you know, like, 
You want to have a hard prayer, you're going to go, God, this is what I really want to happen. I want him to do this and her to do this and this happen here, and I want to get this job, and I want to move to this house, and I want all this stuff to happen, and this is the way I want it, God. This is the way I want it. But you know what? And I'm fully aware of that. I'm fully aware of my emotions and feelings and interests and, and even expectations and all of that. But you know what, God? I want to ask you for something today. I want to ask, I want to invite your preferred future for me to override my preferred future for me. I want to invite your preferred future for me, God. I want to ask you if you'll make that override, and I'm willing for you to do it, my preferred future for me. Man, that will relieve incredible amounts of anxiety that we're all experiencing right now. To keep going with uh, Psalm 81, 10th verse says this, for it was I, and this, this shows up all over the place, this statement in the, old, in the first half of the Bible, for it was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you. N notice, it wasn't your control, it wasn't your wise thinking, it wasn't your plan of action, it wasn't your trying to satisfy other people, it wasn't your understanding of what gave you value or worth, it wasn't any of that. For I, it was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you, from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide. Be available. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it with good things. Open your life to this preferred future that God has for you right now. Well, how do you do that? I wanna leave you kind of with three things. You refocus, you reframe, you refocus on what is God trying to show me. You reframe expectations and where you're going to put your energy. And you redirect, you redirect the satisfaction that you're looking for to the satisfaction that only God is going to be able to provide you with. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, if you want to reduce anxiety in your life, take better. It's a simple one. Take better care of yourself. You gotta go, there's gotta be a balance between what I'm doing for these 40 other people and what I'm doing for me. You gotta be able to sleep. You gotta be able to eat. You gotta be able to go work out or do something that's gonna make your body feel better. You gotta be able to take better care of yourself. The longer you don't do that, the higher the anxiety level is gonna rise. Third, take the fellowship Take the fellowship seriously. If you're, if you're in a small group, you know, get on, a, get on a gathering, get on a meeting, do it online, do it, do it anyway, gather together in a safe way. Be with some people. Do not isolate, do not isolate, do not isolate, do not isolate. Enjoy the fellowship that God has designed all around you, regardless of how little or how large it is. Take the experience of fellowship, seriously, like fellowship isn't going to be the fellowship that we're used to previously where we just come and it's Sunday and all that happens. Fellowship's going to have to take very different forms for a while now, and I think that's a good thing. We're going to end up watching worship together. Hopefully, groups are going to be able to watch worship together. Hopefully, all kinds of things are going to happen. We may do some stuff differently than we've ever talked about doing it before, but the one thing we're not going to do is not take the fellowship of believers, the fellowship that God is installing, has installed into the body of Jesus seriously. You know, we, we all, we all have had our, our form of Egypt in our lives, right? You know, that's what that psalm is talking about. It was me, God says, that carried you out of Egypt. We all know something about Egypt. We all know something about emotional, physical you know, sometimes physical from, from illness, mental, spiritual bondage. We all know what it's like to be captives. We all know what it's like to be a slave to something. And that's Egypt. But you know what? You don't have to stay in Egypt. You don't have to stay in Egypt. God's telling you, look, I'm gonna, I am coming and I'm gonna carry you out of Egypt. And I want you to know you can count on me you can trust me, and you can believe that I'm coming for you. I mean, that's sweet news. That's the gospel. I want to thank you so much for being a part of this today. In Jesus' sweet name, amen.